Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Art Lecture Series, week six. Um, I'm Sha Osha, and we um, will be, today we have Victoria Idangeset Udondian coming to, um, from the East Coast to speak with us. And Sky Hurley will be introducing her. Um, and then she'll speak for about an hour and then we'll have um, Q&A afterwards. And for those of you on Zoom, just remember to put a question in Q&A or raise your hand and we'll try to get to you. But we do have an, an, an audience in this room um, looking at the live stream. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Skye Hurley. I am a student here at Evergreen. Currently, I am enrolled in a two-quarter program, Core Studio, where we delve into the topics of memory, material, and repair. And we do this um, through different art mediums, such as painting, drawing, and photography. I am honored to introduce Victoria Idungazit Udundian, a Nigerian artist currently based in New York and working as a visiting associate professor of art at the University of Buffalo. Her work spans across multimedias, including installation work, photography, mixed media, and painting. In her artwork, she masters materiality, often utilizing secondhand textiles to unravel the untold stories and histories hidden within. Her focus lies in exploring how textiles and clothing can shape one's sense of self. With a background in fashion, design, and tailoring, her work is deeply connected to textiles as she investigates the identities they hold. Ufang Ufok is a captivating installation created by Udundian. The installation consists of a large-scale textile sculpture creating an immersive and ethereal environment for viewers. The textiles are meticulously hand-woven by Udundian and in collaboration with local communities. It's my pleasure today to introduce Victoria Idungazit Udundian. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for that incredible um, introduction, thank you. Um, so, as I've heard, my name is Victoria Donga Satudandian and yeah, I'm from country Africa and I live in New York, between Buffalo, New York and New York City. Um, and for today's talk, I'm going to be taking us through some projects I've done in the last couple of years um, and the most recent one. Um, and in a bit to do that, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. There you go. So my practice is quite interdisciplinary at this point. Um, but it's very important to note that my first training was in um, in painting. But prior to having a painting degree, I did um, have um, a training, an informal training in tailoring. And of course, my MF at Columbia University was in sculpture and new genres. And so all of these various trainings that I've had at different points in time sort of, um, are all, they all come full cycle in my practice. So I work across various media, depending on the project. Um, so I wanted to start briefly by just giving a little bit of context. Um, I am interested in exploring the mythology of the separate sphere, Africa and Europe, or the West, if you will, and aiming to create a nuanced overlap of complexities. Through art, I find a tool to facilitate this exploration being a product of the British colonization and embodying what is often referred to as a hybrid culture, this opens the space to question the predetermined narrative about Africa within Western discourses. Um, my focus is on unpacking the intricate dynamics of this relationship, drawing from my lived experiences that spans both worlds. Um, my practice has been 
driven by textile and the potential for clothing to shape identity informed by histories and tacit meaning embedded in everyday materials. I create large scale sculptural elements and interdisciplinary projects examining the intersection of immigration, labor, and global threat systems, raising questions about our post-colonial condition within an increasingly globalized world. Um, okay, so before I get into um, the projects that I'd like to share, um, I'd also like to mention that, um, you know, my practice actually started in Nigeria and it's important to give that context because I think it's relevant to some of the projects that I will be sharing, mostly my earlier works, um, the first projects I'll be sharing. Um, okay. And so I had a training in painting. So my earlier works was, were very much based on painting, traditional painting um, training. And of course, at some point I got really interested in sort of rethinking my practice because I didn't find myself in the you know painting history I was studying in school. Um, and textile came to me quite naturally, you know, as like someone who was already tailoring clothing. And so I got interested in sort of looking at the um, I got interested in the secondhand clothing market being, you know, um, I grew up wearing secondhand clothes. My mom would go to secondhand markets. There are lots of them in, in you know, in Nigeria. Um, but of course, I was really curious where this clothing were coming from. Um, and so that took me on this um, research exploration of just sort of trying to understand the clothing, where they came from. Um, and so at that point in time, I did some research around Nigeria, sort of seeing, you know, realizing that this whole market system, of course, started from the notions of humanitarianism, which has been the Western obsession um, towards country Africa, um, you know. And, and so I was interested in exploring that around the continent. So I traveled around a few countries in West Africa and also to East Africa. And I realized we had a very similar situation where Africa is basically a dumping ground for all kinds of West from the, from the West. <laughs> um, and so, um, so from that experimentation, I would collect secondhand clothing from those research and I would repurpose them into sometimes large girl installations or I would create what I call hybrid costumes. And the costumes would sort of combine different kinds of textiles, sourcing from secondhand clothing market, all kinds of um, textile, because Nigeria depends so much on importation of basically almost everything. So most of the textiles that are used within the Nigerian context, even the supposedly traditional outfit are mostly always produced. Um, initially, most of them used to be produced in Europe, and of course, today we have very stiff competition coming from China. And so after that research, at some point I got a residency. Um, it was my first residency in Europe, in Venice. And so when I went to Venice, I was now interested in sort of investigating how this clothing market starts in Venice and we have in Europe and how they end up in Africa. So I got to collaborate with um, a Catholic organization, Calitizia, in Manchester in Italy. Um, and from that collaboration, I was given access to the process of collecting clothing, used clothes, you know, through donations, like Mr. View too, you would dump your used clothes in some of the beans that you have lying around the cities. And these clothings get sorted and the good ones would be used to save the locals um, within Italy, within the area who needed clothing. Um, and of course, the batch went, that were not good enough would be sent to a larger center where they're processed and they're sh mostly shipped to developing countries. Um, and so I've been very interested to, not just in um, sort of the idea of this um, global trade system, but also I'm very interested in materiality. I'm interested in the social life of uh, of material, um, you know, in the case of secondhand clothing, I'm interested in the historicities around secondhand clothing. When this clothing are uh, produced in the global south through very repressive conditions, and then they get shipped to 
um, to the West and we buy them in America and Europe, we wear them and then eventually dump them down and they end up in Africa. So I'm interested in the complexities of the history of the material itself. And when the locals within the Nigerian co context buy them and begin to wear them, um, it sort of complicates the whole of that history. Um, so I'm interested in the social life of objects, the social life of things, um, the social life of the secondhand material and all of the histories that is embedded within them. And so while in Venice, um, I did create a project as a result of my research. I had donations of textiles from um, an exotic textile company in Venice, Rubili, um, as well as a ton of secondhand clothing material that were donated by um, the Catholic organization, Calitizia. And I combined this clothing to create the secondhand museum project that we're looking at on the screen. Um, it was a testament of about five costumes. Some were made to reference some Euro European clothing that I had got to encounter in the museums while I was in Venice. While some were made to sort of reference um, traditional Nigerian attire, but they were all made from scrap of like secondhand clothing, secondhand underwears, etc. cetera. Um, as part of this project, I also had um, invited people to wear this costume, sort of embody embodying them in photography. Um, and this, this um, aspect of the work was called the Venetian, um, Venetian portrait. And it was also sort of responding to the Venetian caprice portrait that I was seeing in um, museums in Venice um, during my residency. One of the things that's also important to mention is the fact that because I was create, creating the secondhand museum, the portrait was a part of the museum, the costumes were a part of the museum. And so I started also thinking about notions of museum and artifacts, how they travel the world. I mean, the fact that if you walked into a museum, you have an object and there is a list of, or there's some kind of level that gives you information about um, the history of that object. So I wanted to sort of play with play on that as well. And so this secondhand museum did have some kind of uh, level or histories around the collection. Um, and so for me, this was the beginning of me getting interested in sort of questioning the veracity of historical account and just sort of thinking about how stories become history, who writes history, who validates history. Uh, and so I began to sort of play on that. And so I created this fictional narrative around these costumes. Um, but of course, the narrative was mostly also looking at, um, you know, how artifacts end up in museum, of course, the compl complicated history of collection and um, most of African artifacts that sort of ended up in, in, in Europe. Um, and so this was another um, series of photographs from that um, project. Another piece that I made during that um, residency as part of the project was called Okrika Bell. Okrika is actually an Igbo word, which is a Nigerian word that translates to tat tat. Um, and so the idea was to sort of create the bells. Um, and of course, in Nigeria, secondhand clothing are generally referred to as Okrika. Um, and so in this case, I had collected all of these um, used um, ropes that were used in docking ships in Venice. Venice is an island, so these ropes are used around the clock in docking the ships. So I would go around to collect them because I was interested in the idea of sort of representing some kind of elements of shipment, whether through the material that I was using, but also in the installation, the products of ship shipment could be seen on the installation um, being installed from the floor um, onto the stair wall. And then the last piece that was pretty used as part of this project was called About 1000. Uh, about 1000 was inspired by my going to a museum and just seeing a red shirt. And I got really curious about the red shirt in Italy. And so from my research, uh, research I found out that the red shirt is synonymous with Italian unification. And of course, Giuseppe Garibaldi, who fought for the unification, had about a thousand red shirt for volunteers who were willing to fight with him for the unification of Italy. And there were lots of mythology around this red shirt. Um, some of has it that the red shirt were actually meant for the butchers, but were costed and by Garibaldi's team and used for the fight um, for this unification. So I was interested in having about a thousand red shirts in an installation. 
um, that was done outdoor to reference the way Venetians dry their laundry. Um, 2015, I got invited to represent Nigeria, the Venice Biennial. The Venice Biennial is a major um, biennial that happens, I think it's the oldest biennials in the world. It started in 1895. And of course, the idea of the Venice Biennial is based off of the model of it is based off of the World Fairs. And the World Fairs were mostly a platform where Western nations would display their colonial treasures and commodities. And in some cases, um, you know, they would display um, sort of subjects from the colonies. Um, and so I have a quote here from um, the Black Female Body, A Photographic History by Deborah Willis and Carla Williams. So this quote is from that, um, from that, from this book. The colonial exhibitors centered, uh, catered to voyeurism of the victors of civilization. They were allegories of European hegemony and demonstration of racial supremacy in which imperialism seems to be transformed into natural history. And so, um, very last minute, into our invitation to the Venice Biennial were about four artists from Nigeria who were invited that year. This was 2015, Venice Biennial. Um, the exhibition got canceled. And um, this cancellation, which was very disappointing to me as an artist, but also that created an opportunity for me to begin to think about the Venice Biennial um, and its typography. And so I decided to create an inaugural Nigerian pavilion um, as a project. Um, and so I had about four artists for the pavilion, as well as a curator. So there were about five alter egos that I had produced and created a body of work um, for these artists for the biennial. And so, There were some um, there were some texts uh, that sort of informed um, the way I thought about the Venice Biennial, um, and one of the texts was um, um, a text by art historian Carrie Lambert Bethy, investigation of parafiction in contemporary art. Um, it's, the text is called Parafiction and Possibility, Make Believe Parafiction and Possibility. Sorry. Um, and so my pavilion was sort of informed by this text, um, by the investigation of parafiction in contemporary art as a fiction that critically intersects with the world as it is being lived, destabilizing the viewer's relationship to facts and subtly altering their worldview. Parafiction produces and manages possibility. It treats its reality as truth and thus plays with the viewer's ability to determine the reliability of information presented. Lambert Pethy writes, this is precisely the territory of parafriction where at once reveals the way things are and makes sensible the way we want them to be. The viewer, even myself, want to believe that Nigeria is capable of supporting a viable and sophisticated pavilion at the Venice Biennial. But at the same time, I am acutely aware of the historically determined barriers and obstacles. And so if we begin to think about um, the history of the Venice Biennial as one that was created to display most of these post-colonial countries, and then we already have an understanding of the typography and the fact that having most of these post-colonial countries trying to be a part of this platform, you know, is coming with all kinds of problematic situations. Um, and so drawing on the idea of, you know, fiction and critical fabulation, I decided to create a fictional Nigerian pavilion. Um, and this is the installation of the pavilion. There were four artists in the show. So I'm gonna take us through some of the works that were created for this pavilion. Um, so the first artist, Ravin Smear, was actually a conceptual artist. And Ravin had created um, 
a few pieces for for this show. Um, and the first piece is the copyright forms. This is basically the copies of the copyright forms that were sent to me to sign and to sign to be a part of the show. And so these copyright forms were now screen printed on canvases and pre presented as paintings. These are like the copyright forms for all four artists. Um, Retired Passport was another work that was created by Raven. Um, and this was also retiring my passport, my Nigerian passport to a vitrine and um, having creating some kind of an alternative system where everyone could access some kind of um, printed out stickers to access the world. So sort of really getting the idea of border restrictions, which is mostly always what I have to deal with as a Nigerian. Um, and the last piece of Raven I created was this biennial news. And this was a news media print that sort of collected all the stories around most of these post-colonial countries that were trying to be a part of the final and all the issues that came up that year. Um, and so, for example, um, in 2015 Venice Biennial, you had um, the Kenyan Pavilion um, was created by an Italian and they had Chinese artists in the show. So eventually the Minister for Culture in Kenya had to um, denounce the pavilion, so it was closed down. The Costa Rican pavilion, I think that same year, artists were asked to pay about 5,000 euro to be a part of the show. And of course that also came around somehow and the pavilion was also sort of closed down. Um, and I think it was also that year, um, Oku and Wenzo was also, um, the late Oku and Wenzo curated the show, was a uh, Nigerian American curator. Um, I think that year, um, Ella Natsui, who's also a Ghanaian Nigerian artist, won the Golden um, Globe for that year. And so this pioneer news was sort of collecting all of this news of all of the happenings that revolved around um, these countries that are constantly order, um, always ordered. Um, and most of this news, you might not find them as prevalent in mainstream media. So Ravin wanted to sort of bring this news into this um, media publication. Another piece that was produced by Don De Victoriano was the frozen economy, which is by also um, relegating like the secondhand clothing bells, um, you know, re re sort of re rendering this economy useless by tipping these bells into um, resin. So they all sort of blocked out. Um, this is a detail from, um, from frozen, the frozen economy. Um, there was also a photographer, and the photographer had created um, about four costumes that referenced um, cut dresses from specifically from countries that colonized Africa. So we had cut dresses from other reference cut dresses from from Britain, from Portugal, from France, as well as Belgium. And these cut dresses were made out of sort of a hybrid costume again, made out of repurposed clothing, so all kinds of secondhand clothing combined with um, repurposed textiles. Um, and these costumes were embodied in photography as well. This was taken at the Met, so sort of situating this um, subject within this um, time period through um, the paintings we have on the wall. Um, and some were taken outdoors as well. Um, the last artist for, for the biennial was um, Kebe Gate. And so Kebe was interested in sort of creating um, an architectural model. So creating a platform where African countries could actually show their work. Um, this I think was important because if you do understand the topography of the Venice Biennial, you have the main um, area where most of the Western powerhouses would have your pavilions, which is the Giardini. You also have the Asanali where other countries would just sort of get spaces to show their work. And of course, if you go to Venice Biennial too, you have the newer super powers like Asian countries who are also sort of getting a space to showcase their own work. So there is this topography that you tend to see 
within architecture. And so I wanted to respond to that by creating a pavilion for African country. But of course, this pavilion too that I created was very utopian. It's almost an impossible architectural model to, to produce. Um, the architecture was created based on inspiration sourcing from you know, some of the popular traditional African architecture, but also sort of combining that with um, all kinds of um, Western architectural idea to create a utopian space that is, you know, almost impossible to produce, a space that is constantly evolving. Um, and so through the creation of a real na national pavilion, sorry, Though the creation of a real national pavilion itself would represent Nigerians' belated entry into an acceptance of the linear progression of modern history, symbolized by the founding of the Venice Biennial, the Nigerian pavilion instead locates its power in the future that is hard to determine. As Kudu Oshun writes in his essay, Further Considerations on Afrofuturism, in the colonial era of the early to middle 20th century, avant gardist from um, Walter Benjamin, to Franz Fanon revolted in the name of the future against a power structure that relied on control and representation of the historical archive. Today, the situation is reversed. The powerful employ futurist, a futurist and draws power from the future they endorse, thereby condemning the disempowered to live in the past. The present moment is stretching, slipping from, what, from some into yesterday, waiting for others in the future. So with this Nigerian pavilion, I was focused on the future, drawing attention to the incongruence between the mainstream contemporary art world, as exemplified by the Venice Biennial of the past, and post-coloniality, the future, my installation and the work within it rewrites history in order to, re to imagine a different and empowered future. And so the quote from there is drawn from Kudu Eshing's text and for that consideration on Afrofuturism. Um, and so these are the drawings. So this project's idea with drawings where I would create all of the series of drawings. And from the drawings, I now developed, I worked with an architect to develop um, an architectural model. So I'm gonna play a short video clip just to give a sense of what it looked like.
Okay. And so, um, yeah, so I'm moving to the Monat, which is also um, another project. I started getting interested in creating one of these headdresses. I think this is one aspect of my work that I keep going back and forth with. Um, and these headdresses um, are produced again using really people's materials to reference traditional hairstyles from, um, from Nigeria, from Af Africa, some parts of Africa. Um, and then I begin to sort of collapse this head forms with the cut dresses. So sort of thinking about the syncretic relationship between these um, two forms. Um, so I have a couple of um, installations with different costumes with different kinds of head dresses as well. Um, and this brings me to another project I'd like to share, which is a project that started in 2017 that's the Republic of Unknown Territory. And so 2017, I began the process of naturalizing in America. I came here to study, by the way. And after my education, I had um, all kinds of opportunities. So in a, in a bit to pursue those opportunities, I needed to sort of get at least a residency here to do that. Um, and of course, if we can pause for a moment to think about what the society was, pre-COVID 2017, to put a little bit of context, Trump had just been elected into office and there were huge vilifications of immigrants. Um, even those who had residency in America at some point were threatened because you would arrive at the border and you might be denied um, entry into the country. So there was all kinds of confusion. There was all kinds of um, sort of bureaucratic haphazardness around no ideas of immigration. And also it was around that time that I was just getting into the system trying to naturalize. So I was trapped in all of that frustration. I was trapped in all of that craziness. Um, and so in a bit to make sense of the world, I usually would be talk to my work. Um, and so I decided to respond to it by creating a project. Um, and the Republic of Unknown Territory was birth. Um, so Republic of Unknown Territory is um, a micro nation. Um, I was doing a residency when I first started this project at the Finance Work Center in Province Down, um, Massachusetts. And so um, for my solo shoot to wrap up the, uh, the residency, I decided to subvert the gallery space into some kind of a micro nation called the Republic of Unknown Territory. And viewers who came to the show had to go through some kind of immigration process to get access to the show. So the gallery was divided into two spaces. So the main, the front gallery space became um, the border territory where you had to feel the paperwork, go through immigration um, um, interview. And if you're granted visas, you get access to the show. Guests were not, they didn't have access to any kind of comfort like chairs. And so they all had to stand there. And I had adapted um, the United States um, visa application form, which is such a lengthy document, about a 10 page document, that you literally have to divulge all of your life history, your medical um, status, your financial status. These are all things that you have to declare in this document. And so what I did was to even add more extreme questions where you had to um, divulge your um, sexual orientation. Um, you also had to say if you had committed abortion or knew anybody, anyone that did. Of course, these were all topical issues at a time. And here we are, I mean, Ravi, Ravi, Ravi way uh, <laughs> just got up, um, overturned. And so, after filling the form, you would go through the immigration um, interview, and if you're granted access, you get you know you get into the show. If, if you're not, then you don't. Um, sustenance was also deprived to those who did not get access. So the food, the refreshment we have was in the main gallery. So you needed to gain access to access the food. Um, and so for the exhibition that opened for about two hours, I had about an hour and a half performance. And I'm going to share a short clip from the performance just to give a sense of what um, this project was, in, um, was about or how everything unfolded. 
Um, and so inside the main gallery, there was also this installation, which was made from a collection of cast of my fit, my body, body cast of, um, you know, headphones, a sort of reference, a height hijab, um, and also different materials that I had collected um, around um, Provincetown. And Dripa was in creating this um, object that sort of alludes to the body, but also the body is not present. Um, and so also thinking about notions of migrations, the people who've lost their life in course of migration, migrating for better opportunities. Um, and then you couldn't access the, the installation as well if you didn't get access to, uh, to, the, to the gallery, if you didn't make it through the immigration process. And this is a detail of the installation. So I'm gonna share a shot with you. Okay, please. Discriminate, discriminate against people who are gay, okay. you know. So, um, but of course, there are a lot of other factors that we do take into consideration in issuing visas to the unknown territory. Okay. But I'm sorry, we're not able to offer you visas today. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, you can reapply at some point. Um, is there anybody I can talk to? Is there an appeal? <laughs> do you I'm sorry, visa. Actually, you really, you know, based on the law, you really can't, um, you know, uh, you really can't sue for being denied visas. But you actually have a chance to reapply. Okay. Um, yeah. And your, you know, your applications can be reevaluated. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for helping. Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you. Excuse me. Excuse me. What? You can't go inside. I'm sorry. Oh. We can. We'll get a police to arrest you, sir. No, you can't. I'm so sorry. Oh, I just want to. Take I'm so sorry. Around. Please, do you want to stay back? I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I think you're Thank you so much. Too far. It's okay. I'm sorry. No, it's not okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, I it's know. not okay to you yes, know. You should be. You have to be a law-abiding citizen in this territory. I'm so sorry. This is not allowed. Thank you. Um, so, 
one of the things that was um, interesting about this project is a lot that transpired that I did not preempt. I didn't expect that there will be resistance. Um, so eventually, those who actually had access to the show started passing, first of all, they started passing drinks and food across the border to those that were denied access. Um, bear in mind that the performance lasted about, this is just a very short clip, the performance lasted about an hour and a half. A few people were sort of given access and some were denied. Um, some people got mad. Um, and those who got inside passing drinks across the border and food across the border. And while I was sitting in the front gallery, abdicating the process, the fire exit door in the back gallery was opened and I ended up with all kinds of illegals in my territory. Um, I mean, if I knew that that would happen, I would have made pro proper provision for uh, security. Um, anyways, and so after this project, I now was interested for the first time in opening my studio to the public. And so I had a call out. I was also doing a residency at Project for Empty Spice in Newark at the time. And I had a call out for anyone with immigration story, first generation Americans, anyone who emigrated here that wanted to come to my studio, they would come in and I would collect um, their stories. I would take cast of their bodies, cast of their hands. Um, and this became also um, the beginning of creating a new body of work that culminated in a solo show that I had in New York City. Um, in 2022. And so from my collaboration with immigrant communities, collecting all these stories and all of this cast, I started creating this um, sculptures. But I'd like to start before I share the images, I'd like to share this quote from Angela Davis and Gina Dent from the text, um, from the book Prison as a Border. We continue to find that the prison is itself a border. This analysis has come from prisoners who named the distinction between the free world and the space behind the walls of the prison. This is an important interpretation that undoes the illusion of the powerful nation states on the one hand and the seeming disorganization and chaos of capital's travel on the other. There is a very specific political economy of the prison that brings the intersection of gender and race, colonialism and capitalism to view. Um, so I thought that quote really sort of resonated with some of the things I was grappling with, because of course also around this time, you had situations where um, immigrants were being sort of detained at the borders, they were separated from their children. You also had kids who were left in cages, away from their parents. So I wanted to respond to all of this situation. And so I started creating these cages, the piece on the floor. Um, but the idea of these cages was just not to think about the, um, you know, the border walls, but also to think about several new colonial conditioning that black and brown bodies are constantly negotiating, whether that be the prison system, the border, um, police brutality, all of these um, neo-colonial repressive um, conditions. I wanted to sort of encaps encapsulate that in the project. And so I had um, these headpieces that were sort of made from cast of bodies. We sort of cast it on, on bodies of my body as well as some of my collaborators. Um, this is a detail of that piece. And we made with this hand woven um, fabric that I had, um, you know, woven myself. Um, and this is a, these are the cages and you'd have, these hands are live cast of my collaborators where I just sort of emerging from these cages, sort of struggling to emerge from this, from these cages. Um, this is a detail of that. There was a series of the books that was also dedicated to children where I would have cast of, you know, live cast of hands of children um as well as sort of the things that kids would always you know want to do they want to play with their toys and all of this things. but here they are they're stuck in cages and how to you sort of reconcile um all of this situation um and this is a detail from 
that um, the children version. And so at the end of the day, the whole entire body of work culminated in a solo show that was tacked, how can I be nobody? How can I be nobody? The theme of the project actually came from one of the um, refugee women, for lack of a better word. And so when I moved to Buffalo to teach at the university at Buffalo, I got introduced to a textile center here in West Buffalo that caters to refugee women, for lack of a better word, um, and they help them find economic empowerment through their handicraft. And through that collaboration, I had those women who would come work with me, who would come weave with me and I'd collect their stories as well and would weave together. Compensation exchanges was a huge part of this project because everyone who were a part of the project had to be compensated for their time. Um, and so while interviewing one of the women who had, you know, she was a refugee, a refugee woman who had moved here from Pakistan. And while I tried to interview her, she was struggling to tell her story. And then eventually she was, you know, she told me that she was really concerned that if she told her story, that her community back in Pakistan would be at risk because she was the only one who left and if the story was head out, they would know that the story came from her. And so for that reason, she wasn't sure how, if she wanted to delve into her story. And so I kept asking her, there aspects of it that maybe you would like to share or share whatever you feel comfortable sharing. And then she paused for a moment and looked at me and asked me, how can I be nobody and tell you my story? And in that moment, I realized that that was such a powerful statement. Um, and I started thinking, how can I be nobody? I think I've cut myself repeating it after her and tell you my story. And so after that interview, I emailed the curator of my project. I'm like, we definitely have to change the theme of this project. This is what just transpired. And I think that this moment was so special. And the idea of this question, how can I be nobody, just sort of resonated with most of the issues that this project was about, the anxieties that most of these immigrants face in the course of trying to traverse from one location to another, the uncertainties, all of it. How can I be nobody? Um, the repression, the touch, everything is just sort of encapsulated. So I thought, how can I be nobody? What's the theme of the project? Um, and so, how can I be nobody had various elements it was a sound element, large scale installation. And there was also the, um, the large um, textile piece that I'd produced with this woman. Um, so the idea around this project was also to, uh, to highlight the contributions of immigrants to capital capitalist production. Um, you realize that most of capital production, a lot of this work is done by immigrants. And of course, with what happened in Brexit, you saw what transpired in Brexit where immigrants, you know, Brexit happened, most immigrants had to leave Britain and Britain was suffering. They didn't have the workforce to work in the farmlands and all of these various places. And so I wanted to sort of speak to the fact that immigrant population contribute to the, you know, capitalist, you know, their contribution to capitalist, capitalist production, but at the same time, highlight some of the conditions or the conditioning around which this level is, is produced. Um, and so, a form of work also was took into account um, the, you know, the garment factory worker strike that happened in Chicago in 1910. Um, most of the garment workers at that time, most of them were also immigrants from Eastern Europe. Um, and they had brokered some deals with the government to have better wages, better conditions, working conditions. But most of those agreements did not translate to the global south where most of our you know, um, products are produced today. Like the second hand, the, the clothing um, industry, for example, we know that most of this cheap fashion that we all buy to wear today are produced in 
the global south under very repressive conditions. We do know about the Bangladesh textile um, factory that collapsed and most of the people that, like, that died, a lot of them women. Um, and so I wanted to sort of speak to this idea of labor, the repressive conditions that produces this cheap labor, and you know, also this clothing end up in this sort of global trade systems. Um, they end, you know, they come to the West, we buy them in America, we wear them and they end up in Africa. And so I'm interested in the intersectionality between immigration labor or migration, immigration labor this global trust system, and of course, as well as, you know, the post-colonial condition and within the context of this overtly um, globalized society. Um, so a formal fork was presented last November at the British Textile Biennial. And at the British Textile Biennial, it was sort of installed on this tower. And the Biennial was also in the north of the UK where you know the north of England has huge um histories around um Britain's imperial um exploration in the textile industry, you know, the cotton industry between America, between South America, the UK, as well as India. There's a very complicated history around textile production from the um, cotton production to textile production from the north of the UK. And so this biennial, um, this piece was pre presented within that context in one of these old, um, this is, this building is actually called a cotton exchange. And it was, this building was produced to be a cotton exchange, but of course the civil war broke out and this building ended up not being used for the cotton exchange. Eventually it became like a, I think it became a theater for a while and today is just lying fallow and they're trying to figure out what to do with this historic um, building. And so I thought it was just a perfect space to have this space um, installed. And this is a detail from that installation. Um, another piece that was produced as part of the project was um, Ubomke. Ubom is basically, it trans it's an EBB word that translates to ship, canoe, what have you. Um, and so had created this ship rip that is meant to reference um, the Brooks slave ship. Um, the idea of having it in the Brooks, uh, bringing, using the, the diaphragm of the Brooks slave ship was to bring slavery into the conversation as forced migration that was meant for labor production. Um, but at the same time, it also references most of the, um, you know, ships that languages on the, um, Mediterranean Sea, migrant ships that, you know, languages on the Mediterranean Sea. And all of the, you know, most of the cast of hands that I have collected from my collaborators reside in this um, ship rip. Some of them in black, some in brown, this was made with different materials, and some of them were made with the flags of the various countries of my collaborators as well. Um, there were two ship rips. The second one was made using, um, reclaimed shipping pallet. Um, I was interested in the shipping pallet, given its intrinsic relationship to shipments of goods. Um, and so I repeople shipping pallet to cre create the ship rip, but also collected all of these used shoes from the communities as well as, um, to, you know, recycle centers around um, my studio area. And this is also another view from the installation. Another piece that was produced as part of this collaboration was this um, Menamutum, which also is an EPB word that translates to the workers. And so I had asked my collaborators to donate their used work clothing, preferably in black. And in exchange, I would give them new ones. And so this collected used clothing is now um, frozen to reference their bodies in fallen form. So using that to, you know, sort of think about, um, again, the repressive conditions that labor is produced. Um, but one of the things that I do like to highlight is the fact that um, I also do like this idea of playing with presence and absences. You have, you would find, but you would find the presence of the bodies within the absence of the bodies. Um, and that also comes from, you know, um, art historian Alison had mentioned, um, I think one of his texts in 
reference to um, the Holocaust Museum. She had talked about this aesthetics of absence and how objects could allude to the bodies of their owners when even when the bodies are not present. And so I like to play with this idea of absences and presences in my work as well. Um, as part of the project, I also did collaborate with a choreographer um, who sort of generated movement in response to this work to activate the ex exhibition. And these are just clips from the performance. Um, I don't know how much time we have, let's see. Okay, so you have about three minutes to wrap up the lecture. Um, and so this is a, a video documentation of the um, performance. I, I don't think we have time to watch that. But after um, making this work, also I needed, I should also mention that the installation also had all of the sounds that I had collected, the stories I had collected from these communities were a part, um, were installed within the ship rip. So when you walk around, you would hear them sort of narrate your story. But after this project was shown, I thought I wanted to spend some time working on, on that sound piece. And so I decided to develop that into a three channel video. Um, if we have time, I could show a short clip from it, or if not, would, um, I would move on. I don't know if, how much time we have, if I could share. Go ahead. Yeah, that'd be great, Victoria. Go okay. Ahead. How can I be nobody and tell you the story? Fishing was the first sector to feel the full force of Brexit as people who once depended on the effortless export of their perishable produce battled with the unknown. They kept bleating on that yes, the fishermen are going to get a better life, they're going to get more fish, control of our waters. So that, I believe, made a lot of people vote to come out of Brexit. And it didn't work, did it? I know I have tried my best to be part of my, my home country, but the country has done enough to sort of make me not want to be part of it. I can't allow myself to be stuck in the past. That I need to take the, this opportunity that I have to become the person that I have always wanted to, to become. Britain's economic recovery is being held back by labour shortages. Now these shortages are the product of the pandemic and Brexit. And business wants the Home Office to extend the list of jobs for which low-skilled foreigners, including EU nationals, can get visas. But the government has said no, and it wants businesses to train and hire British instead. I love my city, I love my culture, my country, my friends are all there, my family. But I would say it's uh, it's easier to live here, like the you know the daily life. It's uh, it's easier in a sense. Um, I am still on this journey of really trying to understand my lineage and um, how we, my family, ended up in Rochester, New York. Um, what I do know is on my father's side of the family, they migrated from Anderson, South Carolina, um, during the Great Migration, um, during those very kind of those years when black folks were essentially fleeing, you know, terror um, in the South. January 1997. After coming back to Rwanda, my family tried to start a new life from scratch, but with a country that ju that had just witnessed a genocide, the, the major ethnic groups were always fighting each other. <laughs> I wasn't planning to, to immigrate here to America. Uh, I came originally in 2013 to do like a one year uh, program. Uh, it was part of my, uh, my doctorate. And uh, meanwhile, I met a guy that, and then we started dating and two years later, we got married. We also have to have like a certain amount of money, right? 
to be able to actually get those paperwork. And that's why I was like so, so angry. <laughs> One time when my husband and I was just like walking and enjoying the day, this white lady was just like, you know, talking behind our back saying that, oh, these people, they're taking our money. And I'm like, excuse me? Like, I came here with my own money. Like, I actually contribute to your economy. <laughs> and like, I'm not taking anything from you. But it's perhaps those who relied on freedom of movement who've suffered the most. The biggest issue is staff. We would have had 100, 150 people today picking, and it's just down to, what, 25 now. This farm forced to leave close to a million tonnes of courgettes to rot as its workforce evaporated, a business that has since decided to downsize. Restricting free movement has had a devastating impact, but not just on horticulture or agriculture, on, on pretty much every sector where um, people from abroad have been, have been working in those sectors for years and now they're going home. My mother came to the United States um, to marry my father. He was in the military and he was stationed in Suriname. So he came, she came to the United States to marry him. And then very soon after they got married, he was sent to Vietnam. I have uh, parents that were both well-educated um, and grew up in an environment that was fostering education there. Um, and then the war started and it was really difficult uh, to continue school. Then there was uh, security threats and um, really basically you always need a man's support to get around the society. Um, so that was how uh, we had to leave and start it all over in Peshawar, Pakistan. I'm an Afaria, I'm an Ethiopian American artist, um, and I'm a first generation Ethiopian American. My family came from Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, and my mother came 1969, and my dad came in 1973. They were part of the first wave of migrations, but at that point, they came at a very interesting time, um, right after uh, Martin Luther King got assassinated, and you know there was all of this sort of civil rights activities happening in the U.S. They were naive to the complicated history, the racial history of um, the United States, because in Ethiopia we are all black, and so we don't even think of black in that terms. So we just think of ourselves as Ethiopian. <laughs> working for a gallery and thinking, okay, well, it's either I invest myself um, with the gallery work for two more years, with two plus years with the H-1B visa, um, and then be committed to this job as a way of staying here in, in the United States, or kind of going through the other really radical route of being like, hey, Mark, will you be able to sponsor me? for me to stay here and for us to continue the relationship, which at the time, we weren't ready to have that discussion. Jamaican agriculture letter comparing working conditions on Canadian farms to, quote, systemic slavery. Well, farmers, they're turning to migrant labor because of the nationwide labor shortage. According to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, immigrants make up an estimated 73 percent of farm workers in the U.S. They are facing physical and verbal abuse for not working fast enough. They say they're being treated like mules. They're living with pesticides. Rats are eating their food. Uh, they talk about how they feel like they are in prison. And we couldn't have the country that we, we do have without farmers. Uh, certainly it is a big part of our fabric uh, of, of the U.S. life and livelihood. But the problem may not be a shortage of workers, but of those willing to do the low-skilled, low-paid, often insecure roles the British economy currently demands. Yeah, I was actually afraid <laughs> when I came back here back in 2017 you know uh, because I heard a lot of like um, you know Muslim phobia kind of like remarks I actually wanted to wear a veil but like at the same time I want to like you know to 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 not attract attention to my Muslim identity and whatnot but also um, I think a lot of 
uh, that negotiation happen whenever people move from one place to another? I'm definitely a migrant, uh, an African immigrant, uh, visiting the land uh, of America since 2009. Uh, it was not my intention to stay, actually. I was just coming here for studies. I was planning to do my PhD in African history and uh, Kenyan history in particular, and then head back home and help, you know, make things better than they are on the political front in terms of uh, ethnic conflict and stuff. And I stayed. I am here, I can, I can tell my story, but I have to be nobody. One day, some great opportunity stands before you and calls upon you to stand up for some great principle, some great issue, some great call. You refuse to do it because... You are okay um so thank you very much that's it can you do that again can you clap again <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Victoria. That is, was um, such a, it was like a journey you took us on. I feel like where you started um, with your history with tailoring and painting and, and then your, your sort of graduate degree and then that the Venice Biennale thing with what the pavilion starts to represent um, sort of th this clean, unseeing kind of narrative of who gets to belong and who doesn't, the walls, and then how you bring it into the walls with international borders and migration. I mean, it's just, was such an amazing journey of this, of how interconnected everything is, uh, including our histories, you know, colonial, post-colonial, and just histories of migrate, migration in general. like. You know, in, in all of the continents, these histories, these tensions, um, and then the, and the systems involved, and this idea of absences and presences and and losses, and some of the um, and then <laughs> and then the the thing you did in Provincetown is so good. All the people that live on the Cape, and you just like you know turning the tables and um I, you could see the resistance that you got and i love the that you had the illegal immigrants came in that back door and you didn't anticipate it i just thought yeah all of this stuff is it's funny it's profound it's devastating you know and those big black monuments that you built with in collaboration are just they're just yeah they're quite something what they mean um, so, yeah, lots of, of uh, really interesting connections and, um, and things to think about as a, as a global society, you know, where the labor, where is our cheap stuff coming from? And then this idea of the stuff that you couldn't even resell in this country, that could ship down those bundles. And then what you do with the bundling of the, of the bundles into the, those headpieces and how you see that that kind of, again, kind of um, uh, connectedness of form and, and thinking. So um, I am hoping, yes, um, you, we have one comment, but not a question. Thank you. Grateful for your presentation of learning and art. Thank you. Yeah. I'm wondering if we have any questions in this room, if somebody wants to come down and ask Victoria or give impressions of the work. 
You might have to wait a minute. <laughs> okay, great. We have someone coming down. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Um, first of all, your presentation was amazing. Like that was so incredible. Um, yeah. So my question was, so you started out your con like your presentation with like you started your residency in Venice and then you kind of moved through like working with this history of European art and then going into more like radical post-colonialist um, themes. So where do you see your work going next? Slash like what projects are you working on now? <laughs> Um, thank you. Um, so, yeah, this is such a work. Um, I'm still very early on in the work I'm working now that I feel vulnerable to share, but I'm going to just mention that right now I'm developing a new project that is looking at um, the Sino-African relationship. So thinking about the role of China on the continent of Africa. Um, but of course, I'm looking at um, artifacts that were collected from Africa that we now find in museums today. And these artifacts, to my mind, on the one hand, have become like colonial signifiers. And, and so I'm thinking about how these objects could be used in sort of a retelling of contemporary story about the role of China on the continent. And currently I'm reading a book, Cobalt Red by Sadia. Um, I never pronounced the surname correctly anyway, but the, the book is called Cobalt Red. And the book is looking, is talking about um, the exploitation of cobalt mm. in Congo uh -huh. and um, you know the amount of slave, child slave labor that's going on in Congo. So I'm sort of, all of these things I'm reading is just sort of, um, sort of messing with my head in a way. So I'm thinking of how all of that is going to come full cycle in this work as I'm reading the book and also even like most of the companies exploiting cobalt in China are from China or from Asia somehow. But also they are also sort of, that's like the basic um, base level production. But we're also talking about like all of the giant corporations, Apple, Mike, all of these major companies that rely on cobalt to produce our technology, our cell phones, our laptops. So we're all culprits in this. So I'm sort of, you know, so this is where my head is at at this moment. And um, yeah, and I'm going to China to, to sort of, I'm going on a residency to, to China to produce this work, which sort of makes it really fascinating. <laughs> to me. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, and I had a second question. Um, what artists are you pulling from like right now that you see as your like main inspirations or like artists you've pulled from in the past? I mean, there are a couple of artists whose work I really appreciate. Um, I'd like to start with um, a Nigerian artist, um, one of the modern Nigerian artists, um, Afi Ekong. Um, I, I'm, I'm kind of, I like to always mention Afi Ekong because I find her such an inspiration and she was, um, one of the few female artists you read about from modern Nigerian art scene, like the art scene in Nigeria is very um, masculine, if you will. And so just finding one woman who did not just work hold her own locally, but she was also an artist who had worked quite internationally as well. Um, and also another artist that I do quite respect is Ellen Atri, um, who is also making incredible work out of the continent. Um, and also he's very interested in material histories as well. So I think there's some overlaps between what he's doing and what I'm doing in a way. Um, and I'd like to also add Sheila Hicks, whose talk I went to recently and I was just so blown away by her brilliance. Um, and um, who else do I add to that list? Um, and, you know, 
There's another Nigerian artist who's based out of Belgium, Otobon Kanga, which whose work I've also really appreciated. She works quite um multidisciplinary, really, but also she's looking at um notions of land ownership, colonialism, you know, and the impacts it's had on our lives and all that. So yeah. Yeah, those themes of like disposability with like cobalt versus like material histories of like post-colonial like influenced countries is really interesting. Thank you so much for answering. Thank you very much for your question, by the way. <laughs> Hi, my name is Samantha and thank you so much for your presentation. It was so inspiring to hear i've been also i've been thrifting since a very young age and i always think it's so interesting to see what people just throw away you know and how we can reuse those things um i just had a question about do you have like a daily practice or routine or ritual that you do every day to kind of get you into a creative space mm, that's a good question um thank you for that um, so I've been talking about ritual lately. I've been so into this development expert by name Robin Sharma, and he is an advocate of like the 5 a.m. club, wake up in the morning, use your first hour, you, you know, um, and has this, all these formulas, 2020 formula where you exercise and you journal, you read. Um, so I'm into those kinds of things. So I do those just to ground myself in the morning and just sort of um, get into the day. Um, but at the same time, there's also the reality of life where I am an artist, I am a teacher, I'm a mother, um, I am my studio administrator. So I'm wearing all these hats, which I think is very important to take note of as those of you who might be interested in art. How do you wear all of this up or still have to find time to make your work? And in my case, someone who's working with all these large scale ambitious projects. Um, and so you just realize that you just have to commit to the work somehow. Whatever you can do that can ground you to commit to your work, I think it's just what you do. I mean, for me, I used to be very nocturnal, but now I'm a morning person. So I'm trying to see how much I can be more organized just so I can take on all the tasks that I have to do between all of these different hats that I'm wearing and still find the time to get in my studio and just make work. Yeah. Wow. Well, it's very admirable how much you do. Thank you. And inspiring. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hello. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation, and um, I was uh, super fascinated with uh, just the history of your the materials and looking back at where they've been and like um, yeah and where they're going. So my question was, uh, with all the different materials you've used and how like gorgeous they are, uh, have you got an opportunity to see where they are now to see if like anyone else has used those materials after you? How do you mean, like the ones, what, which of the materials now, and just... Uh, just looking through some of the artwork, like the, um, just like the cloths and all the things that you've like put up, once they are taken down, have you been able to... Oh, is it to... my work? You mean the yeah. work itself? Well, um, I just, I'm just going to let you know that I do have storage problems, first and foremost. <laughs> um yeah just know if you're trying to work at the scale that i'm working you're going to have storage issues and you have to figure out a way to do that i'm still trying to figure it out trust me um the piece i was shown in the uk just got shipped back to me last december and i had to figure out where they need to go and so there is always um that um and just constantly sometimes you're sort of struggling with yourself what do you do with this work and there's so lot you know, I'm interested in, I don't want to have to throw them back in the environment, just sort of adding back to what it is. So I just have storage issues. I have all kinds of storages where I'm storing all kinds of work. And so, um, yeah, I'm still trying to reconcile that aspect of the work. It's a real, it's a real thing. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. <laughs> Uh, 
Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I have a question about how you work with um, fabric in particular, and I was intrigued to hear in the introduction that you also have a background as a tailor. Um, I mean, you have a really intimate knowledge of working with fabrics in lots of different ways. And I was, one of the things I, I think about with textiles and I noticed in your, some of your work, like the, um, the kind of, um, you talked about make, working with fabric so you could show that the body is there um, by um, making the fabric solid in some way. And I'm wondering if you could talk about um, the, just, it's a kind of a technical question on one hand, um, how I know, cause I have students all the time want to work with fabric um, and, but it, but it hang, it, it's subject to gravity and it's, and it's like, how do you actually make it alive? How do you make it do things? You can pin it and sculpt it, but you made it solid. And I wonder if you could just talk about that dynamic and in some, you know, it's a conceptual question. Fabric is subject to gravity, um, and how, you know, you work with it to make it alive. And then just technically, what do you use to make fabric sculptural in that way? Um, yeah, so I have to say, I mean, I've had to experiment with different ways of working with textiles. I mean, I've been, I've been working for, with textiles for quite a long time now. And I'm interested in also just materially the diverse ways that I can manipulate textiles, yeah. Yeah. you know, to suit whatever agenda I have to pursue. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I've, tried with different things i mean in terms of just trying to get solid forms i've tried you know the um, um environmentally friendly material when i'm like i don't want to use resin i've tried cornstarch i've used you know that basically yeah. i've used all kinds of things i've also used resin so depending on um on the piece like the head forms the the white ones um, that I had used mostly water-based form, and I realized that they become so fragile too. And so even storing those, like it's a whole nightmare because I have each piece in one long box to make sure that they're not collapsing and all that. And they are all stuffed up with bubble wraps and all that. Um, but the floor forms, because the coats were also, um, I didn't make them, I had to work with existing wearable clothing. Those I had to, I had to use resin, but what I did was I had to create a structure. I had to create different structures for the different bodies. So I actually had to make structures of bodies that became um, the mold, if you will, yeah. that yeah. the fabric could be sort of draped around, draped yeah. around, and then controlling that with um, with the form that I wanted to achieve. So the different ways of um, doing that technically. Um, but also, what was your other question? Talking about oh, it was just kind of more generally about that. I think, I mean, you kind of answered all of it, just kind of how, uh -huh. that as a material, um, as material kind of, as thinking about fabric, like the, so the, the large, large piece, the gray, black piece is so, um, it hangs, it's kind of uh -huh. hanging with its weight. It is not, I mean, there's the, the kind of what looked like to be kind of crocheted or knitted kind of parts, but then just the sheer sense of the weight. Yeah, that's hanging. just the weight of the fabric, yeah. The weight yeah. of the fabric too. And also some of those woven pieces can be so heavy. That large black piece, that piece has been a nightmare, by the way, if I'm not <laughs> to be very honest. Um, one of the mistakes I made was like the panels ended up being too large. Uh, yeah. And so managing each of those panels, there are about four large panels. And one of them is actually, the first one I did is so heavy. So the amount of clothes. So the weight of the fabric also helps in giving the form. Okay. Um, but they also get so if I had to do it again, I would do it differently. Mm -hmm. yeah, Just always, so I would course. make them like much smaller pieces that are easily manageable. It would be a lot more work to install, but right. I'd rather do that than dealing with having to hire like five people every time I have to move my work, I have to find <laughs> literally. Yeah. Um, yeah, so there is also technically things that I learned in the course of making the work and if I had to do something similar, I have to also make amends based on the lessons learned um, from previous experiences. Yeah. yeah, learn as we go. Um, <laughs> and so if someone was working on the cheap, like a student working on the cheap, it would cornstarch be something you would recommend as a way to stiffen? Um, uh, there is also this material that I can recommend. You know, I don't know if you know about Pavapool. 
-mm. It's a water-based um, power pool, P-A-V-E-R-P-O-L. So you can look into that. Um, that is what I actually ended up using to hold um, the white piece because I didn't, because that one I had dripped from the bodies. I couldn't use any toxic materials on them. Yeah. And so when it started sort of, the glue wasn't as stiff. So eventually I had to order Pover Pool. Pover Pool is um, water-based textile mm -hmm. hardener. Mm -hmm. um, luckily I got to meet a woman who lives in, I'm in Buffalo now, who is in Niagara area. And she was a supplier. I just found her online from just trying to order them and she would send me like, you know, the large gallons of them. So that's mm -hmm. another material that I think is really good. It's, um, yeah. it's not toxic. And, yeah. um, you know, I would recommend trying that if someone wants to try something to harden fabric, yeah. Nice. And also you can use it outdoors. I think it's also great for, it could also be used for outdoors. It has the ability to, weather, you know, weather better than a water-based glue would do, so yeah. Right, right. Okay, great. Thank you so much. You're welcome, thank you. I'm. We have three minutes, so I'm hesitant to, let me see, we have one, no questions, okay. Um, so I just um, want to thank you again for coming to us and um, sharing your, your spirit, your work, your everything, you know, your, yourself. It's been really lovely having you here. We're in a, we're in a, um, the woods, we're way, way up out uh, in the northwest corner of this country. So um, it's always nice to have visitors. So thank you so much. Lovely. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. Hope to see you.